health care is broken, I think anybody would agree, by any measure, there's room for improvement. Um, is this the best set of bills? And I say set because there's really five different bills floating around. Is this the best set? It's not clear. There are a lot of questions that remain about how much more could be done to control costs in the future. It's, these bills certainly do a lot to promote more access to, the, to, to insurance for the uninsured. But will they do enough to control costs? Meller, the Schroeder Center, and the Thomas Jefferson Program in Public Policy are preparing to host a forum on health care reform. We asked her if there were questions most Americans should be asking about reform, they're not. In addition to asking what the public option could do to transform American health care, we also want to ask what an individual mandate will do to low-income families who will suddenly face a difficult choice between buying insurance and paying a penalty to the government and whether the penalty is too burdensome on the family. Uh, we want to look at whether there are enough subsidies in the legislation to really help low-income families who are going to be required to purchase insurance. Something that's important to keep in mind is that the public option is one of the most contentious parts of this legislation and probably the one that will get cut first. Can health care reform be effective without the public option? Take the Baucus bill, which does not include the public option. CBO's estimates suggest that in 10 years, by 2019, as many as 94% of Americans will have access to health insurance and will be insured. That's a big increase from today's levels, and that's without a public option. How many Americans are uninsured, and what are the costs to society? It, estimates tell us that there are 46 million uninsured Americans, but people uh, debate this because that number includes folks who are illegal uh, residents of the country. If we take those out, we're probably talking about 30 million or more uninsured American citizens, and uh, the costs that they impose on the system can be great because those folks aren't necessarily going without care all the time. They just don't have a third-party payer, an insurance plan that pays for their care. So when they seek care, and they do, it's often paid for by hospitals or physicians who are providing charity care. And some estimates suggest that the amount of money that's spent on that uncompensated or charity care is upwards of $32 billion. I mean, we're talking about a nation that spends 16% of GDP on health care today. In the future, that could be 20% easily. So we have to look for ways to control spending. And my sense is that there's not enough innovative approaches being put into these legislative proposals at this time. That's not to say that demonstrations that are funded by the legislative proposals won't generate some exciting ways to save costs and control quality or improve quality. Um, but right now, it seems that uh, much of the focus is on access, and one might wonder if we're doing enough to promote cost control. What is the timeline on the reform debate? I've heard people say that we'll still be talking about reform when we're eating our Thanksgiving turkeys. So when that Senate Finance Committee bill gets out of committee, then Senator Reid will start the challenging process of reconciling the two Senate bills, the Senate Health Bill and the Senate Finance Bill. Um, so we could be talking about reconciliation in, or the, that takes place in mid-October and then floor debate in the Senate by the end of October when the Schroeder Center will be hosting its health care reform panel on October 28th.